Welcome back everybody, hope you're doing well. I think by now everybody's heard that gas and electricity prices are currently going through the roof. And with that I'm hearing more and more stories also from people that are considering leaving the orbit just because it's getting too expensive and they can't afford it anymore. That's super sad of course, and I thought what can I do to prevent that from happening? So I thought let's just make a simple video and talk about how we can make sure this hobby doesn't drain our entire savings account. So I've come up with a list of 10, 10 things that you can do to save some money. So let's just get straight into it. So the first tip is very obvious, but I think we should talk about this as well. Tip number one is to go smaller. Now, especially with the planter tank hobby, a bigger tank can get expensive really, really quickly. I'm not just talking about the glass itself. I mean, of course, a bigger tank is more expensive, but you're also going to need bigger, li bigger lights. You're also going to need stronger lights that are more powerful, that you know, consume more energy. You're going to need bigger filters with more powerful pumps. You're basically just going to need more of everything. And a while back, I made a video about how much does aquascaping cost. And I calculated the total cost for like a 20 liter, so a small cube. And the total cost for, I think it was like a 70 liter scaper's tank. So the small cube, I think total cost was 250 euros. Now this was a high-tech cube with CO2 and everything, so it's still very expensive for a 20 liter cube. But the total cost for the 70 liter scaper's tank was almost a thousand euros. So the tank is four times the size, but it's also four times the price, you know. So yeah, the bigger you go, it's going to get really, really expensive. So if you currently have a really big tank and you're thinking of getting rid of it and just quitting the hobby, just go for something smaller, you know, just don't give up completely. Just sell the, sell the big tank, maybe buy one or two smaller tanks just so you can still enjoy the amazing hobby. Now tip number two is for people who are currently thinking of buying a new tank. And the best way to save some bucks there is to go for a tank made from float glass. So over the past few years, aquascaping has gotten really, really popular. And the majority of all aquascapers use optic white remnant tanks, braceless tanks as well, made from optic, optic white glass with clear silicone. And of course, that looks very, very good. But the question is, is there a real benefit as well? Now, I'm not going to lie, I'm a bit of an optic white fanboy as well. Most of these tanks here are all made from optic white glass. And I think why most people like them is because of the light blue edges. You know, it just looks very minimal. It looks very modern as well. If you would have a tank made from flow glass, this will be a little bit more greenish instead of blue. For example, right here, I've, uh, I've glued some dividers from uh, scrap glass. And this divider is made from optic white. And this divider is made from flow glass. You can see it's a little bit more green. So if the entire tank would be made from flow glass, you would have that green edge all over, you know. And some people will find that less attractive. Now this tank right here is actually made from flow glass, but because it has these uh, curved edges, you don't really notice that. So we, we don't have those green edges. You could see it maybe on the bottom a little bit. But because it's so dark because of the substrate, you also don't really notice it. Now this tank is still relatively small. So if you would have to buy this one in Optic White, I think it's maybe like 20, 25 euros more expensive. So it's not really a big deal. But yeah, I mean, if you put this side by side to an Optic White tank, would you see a difference in clarity, in, in better visuals? I don't think so. So yeah, besides the visual look of those blue edges, I don't think there's a real benefit to optic white glass. And I think the majority of people are just buying it because it's popular and because everybody else is doing it. So if you want to save some money and you don't want to follow the crowd, yeah, just uh, buy a float glass tank. Why not? Okay, tip number three to save some money is to actually buy things secondhand. Now, I think, especially right now, you can find some really, really good deals because, you know, past two years or so, the aquarium will be getting a lot more popularity. People are getting started because they're spending more time at home. Um, but also a lot of people are quitting because they actually realize that it's not that easy, especially a high-tech planter tank, you know? So they buy all the equipment, they get started, and then they run into algae issues, they give up, and they want to sell all the stuff again. So for example, here in the Netherlands, we have a website called Marplants where people, you know, can sell their stuff secondhand. And I think there's something like that in every country. So if you take some time browsing through those websites, you can actually find some really, really good deals. Now, of course, you have to be a little bit careful with buying things secondhand. So, for example, light or some hardscape, if you buy that secondhand, it's not really a big deal. But if you think of buying a tank or like a filter secondhand, I would make sure you do a leak test or something, you know, before you give your money away. But yeah, that was tip number three. I think you can definitely save some money like that. Then tip number four, this one is for people who are looking to buy some new equipment, like a new light or a new filter. Tip number four is to pay attention to energy consumption. Now don't pay attention to the mess, but here's just an example. Here we have two different types of external canister filters. On the left, we have an Oasa Filter Smart, and on the right, I have a JBL Crystal Pro V. So if we compare these two brands, an Oasa Filter Smart 200 does 800 liters per hour, 
and has an energy consumption of 17 watts. The JBL Crystal Pro V, the 900 version, does 900 liters per hour, but has only an energy consumption of 11 watts. So that's quite a, quite a difference, you know? And the same thing actually goes for lights as well. So I recently made a video about my two favorite light brands, Chihiros and Twinstar. But if you look at the technical specifications, um, in general, Twinstar lights have more lumens per watt. So they're actually a little bit brighter, but they consume less watt. It's definitely interesting. So of course, these are, these are just small differences. But if you look at, you know, your energy bill at the end of the year, I think you can definitely save some money there. Tip number five, very simple. Shorten your photo period and make sure the lights are on when you're actually home. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people watching right now that have their tank lights on the entire day and then they're not even home. There's nobody watching the tanks. I mean, of course, it's nice. And when you have a planted tank, you want to stick to a certain amount of hours to make sure that your plants are growing. But if you're, for example, working in 9 to 5, why not have your tank lights on from 5 till 10, 5 till 11? So when you're home in the evening, you can actually enjoy the tank. And during the day, just leave the lights off. That will uh, save you a lot of electricity as well. Super simple. Okay, I think we're at tip number six. Uh, tip number six is to only use a heater if you really, really need to. So right now I have 10 tanks up and running and actually none of them have a heater inside them. Of course, we just had summer, so there was no need for them either. But yeah, there's so much you can say about heaters. I mean, of course, if you have a better fish, if you have discus fish, if you have, I don't know what kind of fish, you might need, gonna need a heater, but I just have some very simple tetras. I have some simple shrimp and they, they're fine at my room temperature. I mean, the house, of course, is getting a little bit more chilly now. I mean, during the day, it's like 20, 21 degrees. But with the lights on, with the filters running, this house warms up pretty fast as well. And these fish are doing just fine on room temperature as well. So yeah, no heaters, and that actually saves a lot of electricity because a heater is one of the most energy consuming equipment in the aquarium hobby, I think. I mean, a general heater is like 200 watt, 300 watts. So yeah, if you can, um, Keep it off for as much as possible that will save you a lot of electricity as well okay tip number seven to save some money is to buy your plants from local hobbyists so whenever i'm doing a build video i'm always showing you guys those really healthy pots straight from the greenhouse tissue culture pots but th those things are a luxury as well and there's so many hobbyists in your local area that just want to get rid of their plant trimmings you know and the best way to find them is either by joining a local aquarium club or by joining facebook groups there are so many Facebook groups out there specifically designed just for selling plant trimmings. It's unbelievable. Of course, you have to be a little bit careful with that as well because plant trimmings can contain algae or can contain snail, eggs, something like that. So you have to be a little bit careful with that, but there's, there are ways to get rid of that as well. But yeah, this is a quick tip just to save some money. Okay, tip number eight is for people who want to use CO2 injection. CO2 is a very expensive part of the hobby as well. I mean, a proper regulator is easily 100 euros pressurized bottle another 80 euros co2 diffuser 20 euros so like 200 euros for a full co2 system is yeah it's completely normal these days you know so if you don't want to spend that kind of money on your co2 system then i would suggest to go for diy co2 now i think most people will already know my super simple diy co2 system but quick explanation we have a one and a half liter soda bottle on the bottom i have a mixture with sugar and gelatin so it's like a jelly it's solid and then we fill the rest with water and yeast so the yeast is consuming the sugar and in that process is producing alcohol but also co2 gas so the co2 gas goes in this chamber goes all the way up to the tubing and out through the diffuser so it's very simple i mean you can't shut it off it it runs 24 7 but i mean a good bottle like this will last you seven eight weeks and i mean you have some sugar you have some gelatin and some yeast and some empty bottles and a little bit of tubing and a diffuser. All in all, I think a full system like this is maybe 20 euros, but that's more mostly because of the diffuser. And to refill it is like maybe one or two euros. So it's very cheap and it's just a cheap alternative to CO2 injection. Okay, tip number nine is to start making your own liquid fertilizer. Now fertilizer itself is not really that expensive, but actually making it yourself is a lot cheaper as well. I recently did a comparison video where I compared the lean dosing method against the estimative index method. And for the estimative index method, I had to make my own liquid fertilizer. So I bought this DOI kit that contained all these dry nutrients. So dry salts that you have to like mix with uh, reverse osmosis water. And then you can get your own fertilizer solution. And that kit was, I think, 30 euros. But the amount of liquid fertilizer that I could make with that kit 
was incredible. It would last me like a couple of years, really. So making your own fertilizer is another way to just, yeah, just save some money, you know. And if you have a big tank, then it can actually make quite a big difference as well, I think. Okay, guys, last one. So we just spent a lot of time talking about how you can save money. And I think it's actually easier to make some extra money on the side. So, for example, we just spoke about, you know, buying plants from local hobbyists. But, I mean, why don't you start doing that as well? I remember, like, a year ago, I used to have this tank full of Fissenden's moss. It's a bit of a rare moss. And if you have to buy this in the shop, it's like 10, 15 euros for a really tiny portion. So I was selling big portions of it for half their price. And people were really interested in that. And I made some good money with that as well. And you could do the same with plant trimmings, but also with fish or shrimp. I mean, if you are setting up a tank and you're thinking, okay, what kind of things are people interested in? So collard shrimp, so like new carotina shrimp, cherry shrimp. You can always sell them to, there's always people looking for that, you know? And we also just spoke about making your own liquid fertilizer. And I know maybe you can start selling that as well. I think all my sponsors are going to hate me for saying this, but I mean, you do what you have to do, right? So that's it. Tip number 10, just try to make some extra money on the side to compensate for your expenses. Yeah, that's it. Guys, let me know in the comments if you are struggling to uh, pay for your expenses for your hobby and if you're considering giving up. Let's start a conversation in the comment section. Thanks for watching. See you guys next time. Take care.